I'm going to pray first. Lord God, send your Holy Spirit. Send your Holy Spirit that we, that I might be able to speak and that you would open our ears to hear the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, it's been an amazing weekend. We have heard so many different languages um, sung and said in this place. I don't know how you are at learning languages. I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm often um, sitting uh, in Pakistan and hearing Urdu and Punjabi and thinking, well, I've got about one in four words here. I kind of think I know where this is going, but I'm not quite sure. And, uh, and then I hear beautiful Farsi being sung and spoken, and I have no idea what they're saying, but I can see the smiles on their faces and I can feel the spirit. And as we sung earlier in Urdu, Half of you, most of you, probably didn't know what it meant. But could you feel the energy in that song? Could you feel the spirit? Parkru, the spirit. Pentecost is an amazing, an amazing, just amazing miracle of language. A miracle of language. And it's a miracle of inclusion. And so today I'm going to look at what happened on that first Pentecost. What did it mean for the people of the time? And what does it mean for us today as a church? So when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. They were gathered together in one place because Jesus had promised that there would be power from on high, that there would be power when the Holy Spirit came. We might have an image up for this, we might not. But Jesus promised that power would come with the Holy Spirit. He said, wait in Jerusalem until I send the Spirit, until the power comes. And so they were gathered in Jerusalem. And it was 50 days after the Passover. There we go. We will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. It was 50 days. The word Pentecost means 50, 50 days. And for the Jews, it was significant for two reasons. The Pentecost 50 days celebration after the Passover was both a celebration of harvest. It was called the Festival of Weeks. And what would happen is that they would take the first cuts of the wheat and they would take them as an offering to the Lord. And it was both a thanks offering, saying, thank you, Lord, for the harvest. But it was also a prayer that the rest of the harvest would be gathered in and that it would be a fruitful harvest. And so this time in Jerusalem, many people were gathered from around the world, from every nation under heaven. Jews had gathered together to give thanks for the harvest and to pray that the harvest would be plentiful. But this Pentecost had also come as a remembrance of the time after after God had taken the Israelites out of Egypt and they'd passed through the Red Sea, 50 days of wandering in the desert, and they came to Mount Sinai, where Moses went up the mountain to receive the law of the Lord, to receive the word of the Lord to show them how to live. And I just want to take you back for a moment to that that scene from Exodus chapter 19. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the fire. Smoke was billowing up. There was smoke like a furnace and the whole mountain trembled and the sound of the the trumpet grew louder and louder. And then God spoke to Moses. And this festival of Pentecost for the Jews was a reminder of that time when they received the law. 50 days after having left from Egypt. And so this is a really important time for the Jewish people. And they're all gathered together in Jerusalem. And this is the time 
that God shows to send his Holy Spirit. And as we read in Acts 2, verse 2, there was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and the whole house where they were seated. And what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so we see the violent wind, the tongues of fire, all symbolizing the presence of God. But this was a new presence. This was a presence that was radically including everyone. It wasn't like the presence on Mount Sinai that was so overcoming that the people couldn't go to it. If you read on in Exodus 19, the people had to stay away from the mountain because they would have been consumed. They would have died if they had gone into the presence of God. And only Moses was allowed in the presence of God to receive the law that he brought to the people. But if you remember, back to Easter, because all of this story focuses back on Easter. Jesus died, and at the point that he died, the curtain was torn in two in the temple signifying that Jesus' death made the way for all of us to be with God. No more is there a separation. No more is it only the priest that can go into the Holy of Holies. God made a way through Jesus' death on the cross for us all to be able to receive God. And not just in our minds, but in our hearts. Because the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and filled their hearts. And the miracle of language, the miracle of them speaking in different tongues, the miracle of people hearing in their own language, imagine how that felt. If you speak Urdu on Punjabi and you were here on Friday, did it not just feel like you were at home? Did it just not like feel that God was speaking to you, that you could feel his presence because you could hear your language? If you were here last night and you speak Telugu, as you heard the praises raise up in Telugu language and you heard the word of God spoken in your own language, did not not feel like you'd come home. This church is a home for all nations where God's love changes everything. It's a home for all nations where the Holy Spirit lives in everyone who calls on his name. Because the miracle that happened at Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came, all different languages were spoken. The miracle of language, not only in the apostles, but also in the people who were hearing. The miracle that all those people from all over the world that were gathered in Jerusalem could hear in their own language. Sometimes I wish that... um, God would give me that miracle of language that I could understand everything that's being said in all the beautiful languages that are spoken here in this church. But what we see with the Holy Spirit is that it is a radical inclusion. It doesn't matter what nation you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. God sent his Holy Spirit so that you could feel the love of God so that you could know for yourself the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. Because all of them heard the wonders of God being declared in their own tongue. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to witness to the truth of Jesus as the Messiah. That power that was first given to the apostles and to Peter. Peter the fisherman. Peter, the one who messed up and denied Jesus three times. Peter, the one that Jesus met on the beach and had a barbecue with and restored and said, Peter, you are the one on whom I will build my church. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Tell them. Tell them the good news about my life, Jesus said. And this is what Peter did. He stood up, emboldened by the Holy Spirit, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. 
And he quoted from the prophet Joel. The prophet Joel who had prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years earlier that in the last days, in those days after Jesus has died and resurrected and gone to heaven, in those last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of radical inclusion. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, male or female. Everyone is included because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the promise from Scripture. That is the promise that we saw at the first Pentecost. Peter was emboldened, and he went on, if you read in Acts, he went on to share all about the, the life of Jesus, the man from Nazareth who did many miracles and signs and wonders, the man who died, nailed to a cross, but God raised him from the dead, freed him from the agony of death, because death could not hold him, because he is the resurrected Messiah. Peter, just like unscripted, he hasn't prepared a sermon. He hasn't been up till midnight the night before doing his slides. He just gets up and emboldened by the Holy Spirit. He just tells them because he saw Jesus. He knew the risen Jesus. He had met the risen Jesus. And you too can meet the risen Jesus in our scriptures. When you read the Bible and you allow God's spirit into your heart, you too can meet the risen Jesus. And I know that many of the people who come to faith, particularly from different faith backgrounds, often meet Jesus in their dreams. When they pray in Jesus' name, Jesus meets them. When they pray in Jesus' name, they see miracles of healing and they know it's real, it's true. They've met the risen Jesus. And when you've met the risen Jesus and your heart is full of the Holy Spirit, you can't but tell everyone else about Jesus because his love just overflows. And so Peter told them all about Jesus about how he had died for their sins, about how we can know forgiveness and freedom from guilt and shame through believing in Jesus, the risen Messiah. And when he poured out this whole story and told them all about who Jesus was and that he'd crucified and he was the Lord and Messiah, the people heard this and they were cut to their heart. And they asked what should we do? What should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing to see all the people who have done exactly that today. They have stood here and repented they have confessed their belief in Jesus as the Messiah, and they have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are filled with God's love. And every one of them, as they came out, they were just crying with the Spirit. As the Spirit touched them, tears come, tears come. Because we feel God's love for us. Feel that love in your heart. Yeah. And as I tell everybody else, it's okay to cry in church because the vicar does. When she gets overcome with the Holy Spirit, I just start crying. That's what happens. Because the Spirit moves in us. And he moves us with love for God's people. 
And when he moves us with love for God's people, we look out and we see the lost and the broken people that need to know that Jesus is the Messiah and God loves them. There are so many people out on our streets who need to know this. There are so many people in our families who don't yet know this. And that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. Because he wants to know that you all are part of his church. You are all commissioned as witnesses to go and tell the world that Jesus is the Messiah that God promised. He's the one that died for every single one of us. And he is the one that now lives in our hearts when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, to know that we have the same power that Jesus had to do miracles, to pray for people for healing and they will be healed, to ask God for words of encouragement for other people, to ask God to search our hearts, to know what we need to change. Because the Spirit comes to convict us as well, to convict us of our sin, but not to hold us in condemnation. He convicts us so that we can confess and receive forgiveness and live in freedom. Shame is a tool of the enemy. The devil loves to hold us in our shame and say that we're not good enough, that we're not pure enough, we're not perfect enough. How can we stand here and tell others about Jesus when we know that we are all sinners? But that's okay, because Jesus took it all on the cross. It's in Jesus that we claim that we can stand here as broken people, but as people who know that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's all we need. That's all we need. Because the Holy Spirit is working in us day after day after day. And we're not perfect yet. None of us are. Not until we get to heaven and we see God face to face. And then his work is done. But for now, let's remember the radical inclusion of the Holy Spirit. No matter what country you're from, no matter what language you speak, the Holy Spirit is for you. No matter whether you're young or old, male or female, the Holy Spirit is there for you. And all you have to do is hold out your hands and ask. Ask for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Whether you're a new Christian and you've just been baptized or maybe You've been a Christian forever. You too can be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit today. If you just hold out your hands and ask. Let's just do that now. Let's just take a moment of quiet. Let's just hold out our hands and say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we thank you that this church is a home for all nations where God's love changes everything. A home for all nations where the Holy Spirit lives in every one of us who call on the name of the Lord. And if you're sitting here today and you haven't yet confessed that Jesus is Lord of your life, I encourage you to stand right now. Stand right now and receive the Holy Spirit. If you want to receive the Holy Spirit now, if you want a fresh outpouring, let's just stand. Let's stand and say yes to Jesus. Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. 
Fill me afresh that I too might witness to your power in my life. Fill me afresh and bring healing. Fill me afresh and take away those feelings of not good enough or shame in my life. Fill me afresh, Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we receive the Spirit, we have tears. Sometimes we feel tingling in our fingers. Sometimes we just feel overwhelming warmth in our hearts. And sometimes we don't feel anything, and that's okay too. But just to open your heart and say, Holy Spirit, come. Fill me afresh. <sighs> 